Thank you, everyone. Uh, so welcome to the uh, panel on the federal approaches to emerging technologies. Uh, we've got a great uh, set of panelists, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call them up. First, I'll call up uh, Josh Barron. Uh, he's a program manager from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, affectionately known as DARPA. Josh, welcome. Uh, Andrea Brandon, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary from the Department of the Interior. Uh, Chuck Roman, uh, Director of Information Technology Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, also affectionately known as NIST. And Scott Rembrandt, our Deputy Assistant Secretary from the Department of the Treasury. Musical chairs. So again, thank you everyone for being here. Um, looking forward to um, sharing with the folks here in the audience a little bit about how the US federal government is engaging and working with emerging technologies. Uh, I think just to frame the conversation a little bit today, uh, in my mind, there's, there, there's really kind of two approaches to this kind of very robust and dynamic uh, yeah, framing. Uh, first, there's operational elements. Uh, we're looking at applying a lot of these emerging technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence, blockchain, IoT, to internal government operations, um, how we can create efficiencies and effectiveness in providing services uh, to American citizens, but also supporting American businesses. And that kind of leads to the second element of, of what we do uh, here in the federal government in, in working with emerging technologies is really the policy and the strategy elements uh, where we're working to support uh, American innovation and American businesses to ensure that they are competitive in the global marketplace. Um, so with those kind of two kind of buckets, if you would, uh, what I want to do is turn it over to the panelists here to give some opening remarks. I'll jot down some questions and we'll kind of dive into how we are uh, both individually and collectively working together uh, to advance the U.S. government's role in supporting and driving forward American innovation in the global uh, marketplace. So, Scott, to you. Sure, I'll kick things off. So, my name is Scott Rembrandt, and I'm from the U.S. Department of Treasury's uh, Office of Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes. And to step back uh, for a moment, the Treasury Department, in addition to help fostering uh, innovation in the financial sector, has a role in uh, best positioning our financial sector and the international financial system to protect it against illicit financial abuse. So there's actually 800 people now at the Department of Treasury that work in this larger Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. And there, there's different components. Uh, I think you'll be hearing from the Deputy Director of one of the components uh, the, from the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network later today. And, and their part of Treasury uh, basically sets the rules of the road for anti-money laundering uh, obligations for financial institutions. There's another part of uh, our larger office, OFAC, which oversees our sanctions programs. There's another part of our office which uh, uh, manages uh, forfeited assets. We're, in addition, we're one of the few finance ministries in the world that has uh, an intelligence office uh, drawing upon all uh, sources of, uh, of information to inform policy. And, and then I work in the policy coordination and development uh, office. As it relates to FinTech, uh, RegTech, uh, and uh, a whole host of assorted um, elements under that broader rubric, I think we think of the issues in, in two ways. One is how can uh, illicit actors use emerging technologies to move uh, or launder funds or engage in other illicit activity? And how can we foster uh, regulatory or technology solutions that uh, encourage the financial institutions or the government to better identify, deter, detect, and disrupt illicit finance? So in, uh, there's a number of efforts uh, underway. One is how, to, as a whole government approach, to understand how significant uh, of an issue in terms of money laundering or terrorist financing or proliferation financing should we be worried about uh, emerging payment systems or technologies. And th the Treasury Department in December, uh, on behalf of 30 government agencies, published a national money laundering risk assessment, a terrorist financing risk assessment, and proliferation financing risk assessment, where, where we try to answer some of those questions, particularly as it relates to virtual currencies. So part of our job is understanding risk. Part of our job is developing a regulatory and supervisory framework that best positions financial institutions to identify and mitigate the risk, which I think Jamel uh, from Tencent will talk about on the, the next panel. Uh, and part of it is uh, 
developing and working with international partners on an international framework where the, the, role, uh, the rules are uh, level set across the world. So uh, there, there's no jurisdictions that can easily be used to uh, basically to, to be used to uh, foster financial uh, types of financial sector abuse more easily. So there's a couple things I wanted to talk about at initiatives. One is it relates to FinTech and RegTech. As you'll hear more in the next panel, there's been a very extensive outreach uh, from the Treasury Department for the last several years uh, related to new type of financial technologies and also new type of regulatory technology uh, possibilities as it relates to improving anti-money laundering compliance. Uh, and that has culminated in uh, a number of uh, which we'll hear more about the next panel, but FinCEN, uh, working with the federal banking agencies, has put forward an innovation statement meant to encourage banks to, to innovate. They recently uh, put forward uh, very detailed uh, guidance related to expectations on uh, virtual currency-related businesses, and they've recently announced innovation hours to encourage uh, FinTech and RegTech firms to come in and talk to them about their business models. So that, that's some of the... Uh, ongoing initiatives as it relates uh, primarily to virtual currencies. In addition, as it relates to uh, virtual currencies in the sanctions uh, space, uh, OFAC, our sanctions administrator, has uh, for the first time in one of their executive orders in the last year clarified that their sanctions regime uh, applies to uh, digital currencies, uh, be it uh, digital fiat currencies or also non-fiat backed currencies. And this is specific to Venezuela, but they've clarified it more broadly. So those are some of the uh, initiatives by our, our sister components of Treasury. In terms of our office, we're the office that leads the US delegation of the Financial Action Task Force. And I'm just curious, how many people have heard of the FATF in this room? Okay. So. Those of you who don't know uh, about the, the FATF, it's, it's probably one of the more important uh, international organizations or bodies that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, it's the international standard setter for what the rules of the road are for combating money laundering, terrorist financing, proliferation financing, and it sets international standards that 205 countries around the world have committed to comply with, including the US. That's, it's one of the reasons that countries' uh, regulatory frameworks in the anti-money laundering space are relatively uniform, and the US is currently the president of this international body, the Financial Action Task Force. And we have three more weeks to go in our presidency, and our leading initiative has been to clarify how these international standards apply in the virtual currency space. Because most of the primary, there's a number of reasons that virtual currencies are abused by uh, money launders or to, on a small scale by terrorist financiers, uh, among which uh, the biggest vulnerability is lack of regulation and supervision in most jurisdictions around the world. And by clarifying these international standards apply to all countries in the world, and they, they need to regulate, supervise, and apply AML obligations to the virtual currency space, we hope that this will lead to changes um, and to a uniform regulatory and supervisory framework across over 200 countries. So by the end of the US presidency, we will hope that uh, these FATF standards have been fully uh, clarified to make clear how they apply to virtual currencies. So those are a few of the initiatives we're working on. I'm happy to go into greater detail, but thanks so much for having us. And lastly, before I forget, uh, if you need to talk to anybody at the Department of Treasury uh, and you don't know anyone, uh, you're welcome to contact me directly. It's my name at treasury.gov, and I'll put you in contact with the right people. We really do have an open door policy, and we, we want to learn what's, what's happening in your space. So thank you. That's great. Is there ever Andrew? Hi, so <clears throat> in case you've forgotten my name already, I'm Andrea Brandon. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, the Department of Interior for Budget, Finance, Grants and Acquisitions, and Property, as well as Small, bu uh, small Business, um, the OSDEBU Office, and Suspension and Debarment. So kind of a lot of different functions that fall under my purview. Um, so basically, at Interior, we um, are actually working on innovation um, in all of those different lines of business, but more specifically, we're starting with the um, aspects of process robotics in our contract area. So basically, we are looking at um, providing pro uh, RPA, process robotics, um, in contract closeouts, and that's only one segment of the contract life cycle, but that is the, life, the part of the life cycle that we've chosen to, to begin with because 
And we, you know, we had a little bit of a backlog, if you will, and so, um, and there's a lot of repetitive processes that occur in the contract closeout segment of that life cycle of the contract's life cycle. So that's the, the area that we chose to begin with. However, we are looking at um, developing artificial intelligence on other parts of our business processes for finance, as well as for grants and um, also for property. So. We're looking at maximizing our innovation across all of the different life cycles for all the different processes, business processes um, within the department, but specifically for the ones that fall under my purview, um, we're, we're actually mapping out all of the life cycles, um, all of the different handshakes, areas of handshake, all of the different areas where there's repetitive processing, and we're developing use cases to look at artificial intelligence and even to continue to look at process robotics in those specific areas under the particular parts of the life cycle. So we're starting with contracts, close out. We will then be moving into our finance area. Um, we've partnered with Treasury on the blockchain with regard to grant payments. Um, so that's a huge government-wide initiative that we're participating in with Treasury. So we're looking at that, but that's something that's ongoing, and that's a pilot that's actually being built on the Treasury with Treasury uh, with Treasury in the lead. So we're actually participating in that. But our main goal actually is to just look at maximizing all innovation across all of the life cycles for all the different business processes. So in addition to that, we're also looking inward and with regard to what do we do as federal employees when we walk in the door and have to actually like look at your calendar, you have to participate in meetings, participate in conferences, et cetera. Um, so we're looking at where can we actually instill innovation in that part of our life cycle. So in other words, I wanna be able to walk into my office and say, Alexa, what's on my calendar today? Who do I meet with? You know, Hey, Alexa, can you change? I'm just using Alexa. It could be Cortana, it could be Siri, it could be um, Watson, it could be whichever um, uh, assistant that we choose, artificial intelligence assistant that we choose. But we're looking at all of the business processes that we do every day um, to see where we can maximize the innovation in that area as well in addition to also our equipment. So with regard to, for instance, we have monitors on our desk, but we know that you can have um, smart desks, if you will, where you can actually, forget the monitors, you can actually go to your desk and move things around and, and your desk becomes your monitor or your conference table becomes your monitor. We're looking at various things that you can do with like HoloLens. So um, for instance, you can actually you know, have the virtual space to open your emails and you can you know, go from area to area within the building and carry that with you and not be looking down on your iPhone or your whatever device you are getting your emails on currently. So we're looking at external business processes with regard to the budget line of business, the finance line of business, acquisitions, property, grants, et cetera. But we're also looking at the business processes that we do every single day as we interoperate within the building or even external with other federal agencies um, and to see where we can actually build use cases to change that technology as well. So we work very closely with our CIO shop um, to make sure that whatever we're developing is secure <laughs> and that we, we have the appropriate authorization to operate. But definitely it's a really awesome time um, at Interior and I think it's an awesome time within the government space altogether because we're looking at um, a, a, a different type of um, evolution, if you will, where we are moving like light speed into the newer technologies and we are we're kind of having to play a little bit of catch up because personally you all use your iPhones or you use you know, Google Home or Alexa in your own personal sphere, but in the business environment, we're trying to kind of catch up and uh, implement those types of innovations in the business environment. So that's pretty much where we are. Don't want to take up too much time. You can ask questions, but I'm going to pass the mic over at this point. That's great. Josh? So hi, I'm, uh, I'm Josh, I'm a program manager at DARPA. Uh, so if you're not familiar with DARPA, we're the Department of Defense's kind of far-reaching uh, research wing. So our, our, our main goal is to um, prevent others from um, surprising us technically, or uh, surprising other people technically would be another thing that we do. So, um, and in particular, I work within our Information Innovation Office, which is where uh, largely uh, cyber and machine learning happen, um, but I'm neither of those, uh, I'm a cryptographer. Uh, and so I run our uh, cryptographic programs. In particular, uh, I run uh, one program that's uh, nearing its final year on uh, privacy called Brandeis, and I'm uh, thinking about what our next uh, program in privacy should be, especially uh, when we created that program, um, big data was kind of less of a thing 
uh, IoT and smart cities were less of a thing. And so trying to understand kind of the fact that we now do things physically that leave digital trails and what are the privacy implications for that uh, is something that I'm very much thinking about. Uh, we just kicked off an effort on um, anonymous communication. So in particular, uh, letting people uh, communicate in an anonymous fashion in um, very uh, difficult places uh, is, uh, you know, and freely in difficult places is a program that we, uh, we just kicked off called, it's called RACE, Resilient Anonymous Communication for Everyone. Uh, and we're about to, in the next week or so, announce a program in uh, Zero Knowledge, which is a kind of a cryptographic technology uh, largely associated uh, these days uh, with uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, particularly something like Zcash, uh, and we're going to try to turn it towards some more specifically defense applications. Uh, probably also on this panel in the sense that uh, I ran uh, what people are often calling our blockchain workshop. So um, in particular, uh, I ran, a I ran a workshop called, uh, it's called ABC, Applications and Barriers to Consensus Protocols. Uh, we specifically uh, looked at permissionless consensus protocols. And the reason we did that, just to kind of take a step back, DARPA's role largely is to uh, push things that the kind of financial sector, the existing kind of uh, ecosystem uh, is not currently pushing, uh, and pushing technologies uh, that are uh, entirely novel. Uh, and, and to be frank, um, permissionless consensus protocols are, are, are largely cryptographic technologies coming out of the late 80s. Uh, and, and there's a whole kind of software ecosystem that's doing it now, which is uh, great. Uh, but if I'm being honest, like, I just, it's not clear to me that that's a thing that DARPA should be pushing on. Um, permissionless, by, contract, by contrast, is, is kind of fascinating in the sense that um, that's a giant ecosystem of people working together where there was kind of nothing incentivizing them to work together. And so um, the question there is, like, what, what, ought, what could DOD's role be in that? Uh, and so we asked uh, three questions. Um, one, uh, could you create a permissionless uh, blockchain, as it were, uh, without having to pay people? Which is another way of asking if DOD stood up a permissionless blockchain, would we by necessity be creating a currency? Um, mm -hmm. The second question we asked was, um, it's a little more theoretical, but basically um, one of the innovations I think that Bitcoin uh, really put out there, so it wasn't using any new crypto, but what it was doing was it was figured out that if I bribe you, which is to say if I, if I have you mine currency, um, that's an actual way of securing a giant distributed system. Uh, and put another way, that's kind of marrying economics with cryptography. And so the second question was kind of, well, how can we do more of that? Uh, and then the third question that we asked was, uh, <laughs> a, uh, a distributed, a permissionless consensus protocol uh, is a system. It's an actual system, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a bunch of physical machines running software, right? And we tend to think of it as being very distributed, but in reality, it's still a system. And so the question is, uh, what are the centralities of that system? Uh, and so that, those are the three questions we asked. And so I'll give you like the high level answers uh, that, that kind of came out of that. Um, so um, can you build a permissionless blockchain without paying people? Not really, uh, was, was basically the answer. Um, then the second was, uh, is there really interesting economic uh, kind of, if I kind of lock computer scientists and economists in a room, could they do interesting things? I think the answer is 100% yes. <laughs> um, and third, which is, uh, you know, should we be concerned with the centralities or underlying cybersecurity of distributed of these permissionless systems? The answer is absolutely. Uh, and we are not considering currently the um, implications uh, for cybersecurity for these systems. Uh, and so um, here, here's a fun example, for instance. Um, I believe last time I looked, something like 80% of Bitcoin miners are running the same software version. So if there's a vulnerability in one piece of code, your giant permissionless distributed system is dramatically vulnerable. So like, there's, um, you know, that, that's, a, uh, that's kind of a concern, uh, certainly if the Department of Defense were to get involved in, in such an enterprise. And so um, you know, happy to uh, talk to that or anything else cryptography. Great, thanks, <laughs> My name's Chuck Romine. I'm privileged to be the director of the Information Technology Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. Uh, NIST is a federal agency that is specifically chartered to uh, help industry become innovative and economically competitive, or, or to improve the economic competitiveness and improve our quality of life. Uh, and that's a pretty awesome uh, mission to have. My laboratory is one of six laboratories. Uh, you're, you may be more uh, familiar with our, uh, both our cryptography work and more generally our um, cybersecurity work. That's in my laboratory. Uh, but we also do physical measurements, uh, chemistry, uh, material science, and, and many other things. Have five Nobel Prizes to show for it, which is not too bad. Anybody else have five Nobel Prizes? No, okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's a great place to work. It's a lot of fun. 
Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, emerging technologies and the way that we do things in my laboratory. Uh, the purpose of my laboratory, first and foremost, is cultivating trust in IT and in metrology. So I'm not going to talk so much about the metrology mission. That's how we help the metrologists at NIST do a better job of uh, measurement through our mathematics and statistics work. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we do in cultivating trust in IT. The way we do that is uh, there's, there's kind of a secret sauce to what we do that's really hard to replicate. Uh, one of the ingredients is that NIST is what I like to call aggressively non-regulatory. So what does that mean? Uh, I, by the way, that's not the same as anti-regulatory. NIST is not anti-regulatory at all. We work very closely and collaboratively with regulatory agencies to help support their missions uh, through uh, standards and technology. Uh, the reason we are aggressively non-regulatory is that that non-regulatory role that we have allows us to collaborate very closely with industry, which is absolutely essential to what we do. Uh, a, an easy example of that is the work we do in cryptography where we develop uh, new standards and uh, uh, for, for cryptographic algorithms. We could not do that with the approximately 20 to 25 cryptographers that we have at NIST uh, and have any credibility. We have to have an open, transparent process where we engage the entire cryptographic uh, community in helping us to, uh, to, to uh, try to attack the, the candidate algorithms. Uh, and, uh, and so we get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours of uh, contributed work around the world uh, to help us execute on that mission. We can only do that if we're non-regulatory. Otherwise, uh, the door slams in our faces uh, and we can't, uh, we can't do that. The reason I say aggressively non-regulatory is that periodically our deep technical expertise, which is, by the way is ingredient number two, uh, uh, is, uh, brings us to the point where if Congress or the administration might say, well, you guys are the real experts here. Why don't you take on this regulatory role? And we always have to push back very hard and say we cannot do that because what you will gain is far less than what you will lose if we, if we become regulatory. Uh, that deep technical expertise is, is critical to our ability to, uh, uh, to stay on the leading edge and of these emerging technologies, as, as I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and then uh, the third ingredient is sort of an outgrowth of the first one, which is this, uh, this absolutely fundamental collaboration that we get with industry. Um, a lot of times I'm asked, gee, with your approximately $150 million uh, laboratory, how can you possibly move the needle on a multi-trillion dollar industry like IT? And the answer is we are nimble and fast because we work with the people who are moving the frontiers of that, uh, of that industry. And so that's how we uh, can, can do it, accomplish our mission. Uh, I want to talk just very briefly, and then we can uh, start the questioning. Uh, we need to be grilled up here. The, uh, uh, there, there are a few uh, things that we're looking at right now that are critically important. Um, we, we have been in the cloud computing space for many uh, years now, uh, including standards for service level agreements and standards for the vocabulary surrounding uh, cloud computing, and that's had an enormous impact. Um, we're, we're pivoting now. We, we've got some uh, work in blockchain since that's being discussed uh, currently. We have a, we have a blockchain laboratory. Uh, now, I want to be sure that you understand we do not in that laboratory do anything with existing currencies. Uh, so there is no, uh, no cryptocurrency work going on. We're just talking about the fundamentals of blockchain. Uh, we don't use federal dollars to do anything nefarious about currencies. Um, so with that said, um, we're also very heavily invested now in artificial intelligence, and we'll get the chance to talk a lot about that. Uh, we're also working collaboratively with our physical measurement laboratory on quantum information science. And that has sort of two implications. One is, you know, AI is going to be a multi-trillion dollar industry. Quantum information science is going to be a multi-trillion dollar industry. We're doing things in the forefront of both of those to try to uh, uh, galvanize the community and to try to maintain U.S. leadership in those areas. Um, in the quantum information space, uh, one of the critical things that we're doing is currently we have a competition going on to select in a, several years 
uh, the quantum resistant algorithms in cryptography that we're going to need to ensure that we uh, retain a secure uh, infrastructure uh, for cryptography. Um, I could go on and on because I love talking about ITL more than anything else. By the way, my license plate reads ITL ROX, uh, which, which my staff gets a real kick out of. But, uh, but anyway, we've got about 400 people and they all sort of laugh at me as I drive by. But anyway. Um, so with that, I think we should open it up. Great. Thanks, Chuck. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce uh, myself. So I'm Adam Luce, and I'm the Director for uh, Information Communications Emerging Technology uh, at the Department of State. Uh, our office is in our Economic and Affairs uh, Bureau, and we basically oversee and help coordinate and facilitate the U.S. government's international engagement uh, on digital economy issues, internet governance. Um, for example, one of the more recent uh, issues that we worked on, we supported uh, the White House in the development of the uh, executive order on artificial intelligence. So this was a, this was a big win, I think, uh, across multiple fronts uh, for both the U.S. government and U.S. industry, um, where we're looking to advance uh, artificial intelligence industry um, through investment, uh, research and development, and, and, and workforce development and training. Um, these are very important basic elements. Um, so the executive order, I think, really kind of freed us open um, to basically uh, work with industry and engage uh, both domestically here in the U.S. as well as uh, internationally. Um, and that's a role that our office uh, played very heavily in. Um, the second element that we worked on shortly thereafter was we leveraged the executive order on artificial intelligence uh, to work with the uh, OECD on the establishment of the recently adopted uh, artificial intelligence uh, principles there. Um, where we're looking to basically support a transparent, accountable, uh, trustworthy, human-centric AI. Um, those principles were adopted last month, um, and again, that was a big uh, win, I think, for the U.S. government and for American businesses, um, where we have basically now a foundation, a framework of, of principles for artificial intelligence, um, which we can now use um, to basically advance uh, American uh, innovation. We can use to advance investment in research and development and focus um, workforce training and development. Um, those uh, recommendations we're also working to push into other multilateral fora, like the upcoming G20 ministerial. Um, so what you're seeing is you're starting to see some consistency um, with uh, values, with uh, foundational principles that the U.S. government and American businesses can really get behind and support in advance in the global marketplace. And that's, that's key for ensuring a continued uh, open, secure, and interoperable internet, um, which is the backbone of our digital economy. Um, so the State Department plays a leading role uh, in, that, in that sphere. Um, one thing that the panel kind of started to touch on, and I'm going to start the grilling session, um, and I'm not throwing any softballs here. Um, okay, I'm going to throw it for a softball. Um, but one thing that I kind of heard talk about, the underlying element here was culture, a culture of innovation. Um, I want to start kind of at the micro level. I want to start at the culture of innovation within our own organizations, um, and then the culture of innovation um, at uh, the government level. Um, each of you talked a little bit about how there is a supportive element. And I will say, as, as great as that sounds, um, I know from my you know, 17 plus years of experience working in and with the federal government, that is not the case. Culture is actually, a culture of innovation is very hard. There's a lot of risk aversion to advancement and applying technology. So I would like each of you to talk a little bit about the culture within your own individual organization and how it has worked to promote a culture of smart risk taking, of applying innovation to create efficiencies and effectiveness. All right, well, uh, I have to say I'm always amazed. So if, if you work in the federal government, you have you get something called the PIV card, which is basically your ID card to get into your building. And uh, the Treasury Department, being at the cutting edge that we are, you now can insert it in your computer, so only you can use your computer. Um, and you would think you would be able to use that PIV card to enter every, any, every federal, federal building. And in fact, that is not yet the case. And it always amazes me, well, uh, I can get into Department of Treasury and other elements of the U.S. government. There are pilots for, to, uh, to onboard airplanes now where you need no identification and biometrics can be used. So I, I'm not sure if we, uh, I should be speaking on behalf of being the cutting edge of uh, technology and innovation uh, from a personal level, but I can talk a bit about what uh, our department is doing in, in our part of the Treasury Department, which is uh, geared towards protecting the, the, the 
domestic and international financial systems. One is integrating our components from a data management perspective. Uh, there's a, there's, as you can imagine, there's a lot of systems and uh, that, that need to be further integrated and better management of data. And it's, it's one of the key priorities of our, our undersecretary. We've appointed the chief data officer for our, our part of Treasury. As it relates to the financial system itself, our goal is to put our financial system in the best place to deter, detect, and disrupt all types of illicit finance. The, not only the predicate crimes, but the, the funds that are generated from those crimes and laundered. And to give you a sense, uh, in the United States today, drug trafficking and types of fraud generate 300 billion US per year. That's just un certain types of crimes, 300 billion a year. So, it's, so our job is to help protect our financial system and to do that, we know, A, that we need to have a strong regulatory framework where financial institutions are supervised for compliance and uh, non-compliance needs to be uh, uh, dealt with through enforcement mechanisms. But by the same token, we need to foster innovation in the financial sector where banks and others are not afraid to try to use the latest technologies and machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, to better identify uh, potential illicit finance and then report it to, uh, to FinCEN. Uh, so law enforcement will have access to these type of reports. So there's been a lot of efforts underway, which I see uh, the director of FinCEN, Deputy Director of FinCEN, Jamel Hindi, is walking in now. So he will talk a bit more about this during his panel. There's a lot of efforts underfoot to encourage the banking industry and the financial sector to innovate without fear that uh, if they built a more effective system for identifying illicit activities, they won't be penalized for that. And I think that's something um, Jamel will probably talk about in his panel. So I would basically say that uh, with regarding culture, there's two main things that I've seen. The first one and foremost thing is the federal uh, employees and staff really caring and having concern about whether the newer technology is gonna replace their job. And so basically one of the ways that we've been able to have success in moving the innovation forward is to let them participate, let the federal staff participate in the different brainstorming groups um, uh, with regard to whichever technology we're looking at. So whether it's artificial intelligence or whether it's um, a bot, you know, uh, whether it's a, an RPA bot that we're gonna take a look at the repetitive processes that the bot can replace, or whether it's a chat bot, you know, that's gonna help um, internal staff as well as external stakeholders be able to garner information quicker um, and, and uh, drill down faster into some of the more weedier information. The chat bot is very helpful with that. Um, and letting them also come up with use cases. And they get to develop the use cases so they don't develop themselves out of a job, so to speak. So that's been very helpful because they've been able to see wherein you know, this can be very helpful to move forward with the innovation, wherein some of the processes are very tedious and they couldn't get to the, the really yummy parts of the job that they enjoy, that is self-empowering. Now we can put a bot in there and they can get to the meatier, yummier part of the, or the job that's inherently governmental that we can't use a bot for, and that they can have dialogue and conversation with each other and feel more empowered to do their jobs. The second thing that um, I've seen with regard to culture is the younger um, staff people are coming to us older people and saying, why are we still using this? You know, why do we still have this software? When are we gonna change? Why, I can do this at home. I can go talk, you know, talk to my, um, to Nest and say, turn my heat to here or to there. Why are we still using this software and this monitor and this, you know, et cetera? And the older employees were like, it works, what's the problem? You know, we don't need to change it. You know, what's, why do we need to change? So, so Mary and those two together having us work um, more cohesively on working groups and, and letting our older people like me help to develop use cases and help to do brainstorming. And some of those things we recognize that, you know, we too would like to kind of unburden very tedious types of tasks. And, and so we're like, oh, this bot would be really good doing that. Oh yeah, that works, this is good. So in that situation, those are the two really um, key things that I've seen that has been, 
you know, challenging for change in culture, but also something that if you focus on it, it can help move things along, move the innovation along. Um, with regard to one of the more current use cases that we're looking at that's kind of got everybody really excited, worried people initially, but they're excited about it now, is we're looking at putting an artificial intelligence behind the scenes on like several of our uh, business process software. So for instance, um, our grant system. Putting an AI behind it so that it can monitor um, what the employee, that individual employee is doing based on a set of competencies, skill sets, knowledge, skills, and abilities that, that we've trained the AI to look at. And we're saying that a person um, that's carrying out this particular function should have these types of skills and abilities, et cetera. We're training it. And then, of course, it's self-learning as well. But we put some boundaries around it. We don't want that whole runaway AI situation going on. But um, basically, um, looking behind this, it's working behind the scenes. And as the employee is engaging in the system, it can pop up on the screen and say, you know, here are some additional marketing, you know, uh, areas that you may want to look at, or here are some other terms and conditions that I note that you didn't put into your agreement, or here's some other regulations that may be applicable to this. I notice you're kind of having a little bit of issues with this, or you know, in a nice way. And yeah, I may not be making it the nicest terminology right now, but. We're looking at putting that AI behind the scenes so that it can become like a virtual assistant to the employee, kind of like real-time training, real-time coaching, real-time executive coaching, et cetera, facilitation to that, to that individual one-on-one uh, -on -one so that we can help. Um, you know, we keep getting these studies that come from, um, from GAO and from our own internal um, inspector generals that say our staff, our workforce is not trained effectively, et cetera. So we're looking at how to address that using artificial intelligence technology. So everybody's actually kind of excited about that. So they're working on it. It's not something that we at the top have done and we're enforcing it down onto people. It's coming from the bottom up and, and they're participating in it as well. So. Now, Josh, you working at DARPA have innovation basically within your mandate. So yeah. that was literally a softball for you. But talk a little bit yeah. about how you all focus, um, because yeah. with such a broad innovation right. mandate, you could go all over the place. Right. How do you kind of focus and prioritize? Uh -huh. So um, I would say, right, so we're, we're, we're kind of structurally unique as a government organization. Like, I, I have an expiration date on my badge. I know the day they're going to kick me out. Um, <laughs> and, and so like, and none of it, so, which is another way of saying none of us are permanent. Uh, and so I came from Rand Corporation. Um, and so literally, they bring you in the door. They're like, all right, cool. You have four years. Make as much of a difference as you can. Um, and then you have an entire support staff who knows that every single program manager has their hair on fire trying to make the difference that they want to make. Uh, and so you know, basically, you know, I, I think of you know, what are, because I have a bit of a policy background, I try to think of what is the intersection of technology and policy to make a difference. Um, for me, privacy, uh, anonymity, uh, are, are huge are huge issues that I think um, DARPA can will by no means be the major like the only change maker in there. But if we can do anything, it would it would be very helpful. We have other people pushing um, AI and cybersecurity, AI and cybersecurity at the same time. Uh, we have uh, people. It's largely driven by personal passion, which is another kind of weird part and also kind of a great part about DARPA in the sense that like we're not going to be the comprehensive organization doing all the things with a giant strategic plan. That's just not how we, it's not how we do. We bring in the people who have just like mad passion about a specific thing and they go and do that thing. Uh, and then they kick you out and then they can bring in another person who does, you know, who has their thing that they're going to do. And so um, it, it's kind of a heck of a place to be where like every single day it's just intense, intense urgency to do as much as you can in that day. Uh, and you know, you can talk about speed of contracting and all other fun stuff, which we're pretty decent at in the scheme of things. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heck of a place to be. Um, and, um, but as I joke, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a tourist in, in terms of a, as a federal government employee just because, because of the nature of what we are. But yeah, I mean, we are, we are built 100% from the ground up to make as much innovation as we can as fast as possible. Great. And Chuck, you touched one point you made was about building trust in, in, in IT. And it, t tell how that, that element is kind of built into your old culture, that element of trust, because that's a very fundamental aspect. It, so. It's critical, and it does actually help uh, drive our culture, because every employee in ITL certainly knows uh, that that's the purpose of our entire laboratory, and it helps decision making. It helps people focus on what's really important. Um, the example I'll give, um, and again, you know, innovation is, is part of our mission statement uh, for the entire agency as part of the Department of Commerce. Um, the, uh, an example of how we drive that is in the artificial intelligence program that we've developed. 
Uh, it is natural for us to think about how we would cultivate trust in artificial intelligence, and we, and we have characteristics that we think AI uh, needs to, uh, that we need to pay attention to, and we have active research programs in the areas of security, reliability, resilience, robustness. These, these things overlap to a large extent. Privacy is another critical issue uh, with artificial intelligence ingesting so much data. Uh, and so, you know, I have to be a little bit uh, a sanguine about that to some degree, but you also have to be very careful. Um, I think the real issue uh, from our perspective uh, in the way we set up our research program in AI is a half of our research program is dealing with those particular foundational elements to drive trust in artificial intelligence. The other half is we, my laboratory funds other laboratories at NIST to begin using AI to improve the way that they do measurement science. And so they're using machine learning, they're using computation in new and novel ways funded by my laboratory, sorry about that, to, uh, to ensure that we drive the adoption of artificial intelligence to improve the way that the entire organization executes its mission. Great. Um, and I'll jump in uh, for our part. At the, at the State Department, um, you know, our engagement is very externally focused. Um, so internal uh, innovation can be somewhat of a challenge for us uh, in the respect that um, as kind of a, you know, the lead on foreign policy, we're, we're really putting a lot of our staff resource and time and efforts. And we have a great uh, bureau, the Information Resource Management Bureau, and a few other bureaus that have innovation offices across the State Department. And there's been a number of initiatives um, over the years. Uh, one of them was the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review um, in 2010 and then in 2015, where we looked across the State Department and USAID, um, who's kind of our sister agency uh, on, on uh, foreign assistance, about how we can improve our business processes uh, internally. And we focused a lot on, on IT, we focused a lot on data sharing, and we had a lot of uh, revelations about, there's a lot of innovation uh, specifically around how we are not looking just solely on operational processes, but policy. Um, you know, how we can look to uh, leverage the interagency uh, and the private sector uh, through a multi-stakeholder approach to advance our objectives on policies internationally. Um, so what we start to do is think about how we can innovate within those types of processes. Um, and that's where, you know, for us, our kind of focus on innovation um, can get outside of our kind of operational sphere. Um, so unfortunately, um, uh, you mentioned iPhones, Andrea. Uh, we're still using Blackberries. Um, <laughs> no secure is what, is, is what we're told. Um, you know, so, so I, I, again, innovation can somewhat be a challenge, but again, we have pockets of innovation where we're looking to kind of focus more on the policy front. Um, and that's where I'd, I'd, I'd like to shift real quick um, to uh, kind of closing remarks, uh, kind of to the external focus. So real quick, how do we, how do we work with industry folks um, on advancing policies? How do we bring a multi-stakeholder approach um, to advance our individual mandates at our agencies, but as well as the U.S. government. So, um, I guess I'll kick it off. I, in short, uh, to, to do that, it, it's essential that our department and the different components of the Treasury Department that I talk to have uh, the firmest understanding possible of how financial technologies are changing the financial landscape and also how regulatory technologies uh, and their implications for improving uh, the fight against illicit finance. That's uh, instrumental into us for us making good policy. And 10 years from now, I, I would like to, as I do today, live in a country where I think we have the strongest possible regime to identify and report illicit finance. And that's going to require a lot of technological innovation, both in our financial sector and within the government. But where that starts is a robust dialogue with the industry. And as I said at the outset, uh, we really do have an open door policy, and we're happy to speak with all of you. Thank you. So basically, we have we participate in these types of conferences. Uh, we have various employees or staff that participates at various conferences and various levels. So we get to engage with our stakeholders during the conferences. But in addition to that, we have industry days and reverse industry days where 
we invite state, um, the business community to come in and, and speak to us about what they're doing, and then we have the other side where we go out and we have we host a very big industry day where we can actually um, go out and say this is what we're looking for and to garner feedback, um, almost in like a town hall type of setting. So we do both types of um, or all of those different types of methodologies in order to um, engage our stakeholders and, and ensure that we're receiving the appropriate information back from um, external um, and that the industry also knows what we're expecting. And I like to tell, whenever I go to the, any of these conferences, I like to tell all of you that, um, you know, just kind of like a heads up, the government is moving forward in this innovation. So if you, whatever it is you're offering to us, if you don't have you know, your product isn't engaging with process robotics or artificial intelligence or, you know, it's not on the cloud or et cetera, then that's something that you as your, you know, your own organization will have to go back and, and take a look at whatever that product is that you're selling to us um, because we don't want your old product and then have to pay extra to get you to, to innovate it. We, wanna, we want a newer product that will help us all move forward um, into the 21st century. Great. Yeah, so I mean, every program manager at DARPA is in constant contact with the, with industry because you know the way that we work is by understanding kind of where you are. I mean, the coolest one of the coolest parts about my job is like getting surprised at least once a month where it's like, oh my god, I had no idea this was possible because some company somewhere just goes and says, hey, here's this thing we can do, right? And so the way that we do what we do is by keeping the pulse on every single on on just industry as in academia, obviously as kind of broadly as as possible. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if we're, if we're not engaging, we're doing something terribly wrong. Chuck? Uh, I just close my part by saying that um, I, I already alluded to the fact that we partner very closely with, uh, with leading IT uh, industries. We have the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence uh, in Gaithersburg, where we partner with more than 40 leading IT companies to improve the state of uh, cybersecurity, broadly speaking. Um, the thing I would just say, perhaps a little, uh, emphasize a little more, is uh, we're also heavily involved uh, in interagency processes to try to ensure that the voice of uh, industry that that we comes naturally to us is also uh, echoed in the discussions that we have in the interagency space. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, one last thing I think is the whole notion of. Uh, this, this innovation and uh, sort of uh, on, the, on the coattails or in partnership with industry, uh, I think is, is just a, a critically important thing for keeping the pulse on, on uh, what's going on that can benefit the federal government broadly speaking. Uh, it's very easy for us to get complacent with the processes and, the, and you know, complacence is the enemy of safety, it's the enemy of uh, virtually everything in government. So, you know, being complacent is not the, the space to be. One last quick thing is uh, uh, NIST has sort of four core values, like most places have core values, except there's a difference at NIST. We actually live these every day, uh, which is really pretty exciting. So, uh, perseverance, integrity, excellence, and inclusivity. And the perseverance is we're more than 100 years old and still working on uh, 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 critical elements. We can do that for decades if necessary. Uh, so I don't have an expiration date stamped on my forehead. I, I like to joke with my staff that I'm, I'm a short timer. Uh, I'm only gonna be around for another 20 years in this job. And they, they're laughing less as the time goes by, but that 20 years never changes, right? So, so anyway. Great, thanks Chuck. Um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and close. Um, again, I welcome everyone to, to, to engage with us individually outside of this. Um, so thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>